I'm going to present under this subject a point of view about the present situation in quantum gravity and what we can learn from it. I have my talk, and I should emphasize, I like to be interrupted. I'm a physicist, not a philosopher, although we, we all have our dreams and aspirations. I'm afraid I have to admit, as you'll see, I'm still a physicist. But I hope I'm sensitive to your interests and concerns. Um, there are a lot, I've done a lot of different work related to quantum gravity and foundational questions in physics. Um, some of my work is, is, I like to think, radical or novel. But I decided on thinking what to do that rather than present an argument, for example, that time is fundamental rather than emergent, uh, which uh, much of my work has been related to. I thought I would represent the field of quantum gravity by giving a kind of critical summary of where the field is. And I'll also be covering some things which are necessary background. Everything here is light and non-technical. So please, if somebody has a question, if it's something you don't understand, we've got the time interrupt and, and ask. I'm necessarily going to be alluding to and skipping lots of technical details, but I don't want to be so light of a touch that nobody understands the, the point. The question you should be thinking about, as, well, let me first say the talk has six parts. I'm going to, since I'm talking about relationalism, I'm going to talk about what I see as the principles of relationalism, and this is a physicist talking, so for me, philosophical principles are aspirational. They're not outlines of metaphysics. They're inspirations and aspirations and guides to choices we have to make in research. Then I'm going to talk about some choices we have to make, even if we are convinced that we should be relationalists when it comes to space and time. There are three important choices we have to make that divide relationalists. Then a few points of background, which is really necessary physics to think about quantum gravity, in my opinion. And again, this is all with a light touch. Then I'm going to talk about five different approaches to quantum gravity that I think that somebody who wants to think critically about the present situation, quantum gravity, should know about. Um, I, I don't mean to flatter myself, but I think I'm one of the few people in the field of quantum gravity who's worked on several of the different extent approaches. There's this funny thing, and I hope this doesn't happen in your field, where people tend to sign on and spend a lifetime or a career working on one approach to quantum gravity. And that, to me, is really self-defeating. It's an interesting, in fact, it's probably the most interesting fact that you as philosophers should grapple with, that there are at least half a dozen partly successful quantum theories of gravity, and none of which are completely, are completely successful. And that's peculiar, and the question you should be asking yourself is how do we get into such a mess, and how do we get out of it? Because um, your role as philosophers who know how to think critically and originally is to help us, lead us out of the darkness and help us get out of this mess that we physicists have gotten into. So I'm going to talk about these different approaches. Again, the light touch, the basic idea, the basic results, the strong points and the weak points. I'm sure some of you will disagree and we can have as lively a discussion as our chair will allow. Then I'm going to talk about the lessons that I draw from the situation and propose my way out, which is to, to try a different strategy based on getting, based on first principles. Okay, are you with me? I can see you, but I can't hear you. I don't know if that's good or bad. I think you can okay. hear us when we speak, right? I hear you when you speak, yes. <laughs> good. So here is a physicist's take on relationalism. 
Relationalism for us is the tradition of thinking about the nature of space and time that we trace to Leibniz, Mach, Einstein, and others from the point of view of those like myself, active in quantum gravity, who think of ourselves as relationalists, and quite a few of us do consciously, we owe this to the inspiration and the work of really two people who are major influences on my generation, younger generations working in quantum gravity, who are John Stachel and Julian Barber. And if you want to understand why we say some of the crazy things we do under the guise of relationalism. Um, there's a history in which the, the basic literature in the subject was relayed to us by those and others, but they played a crucial role. Now, as I said, for me, philosophical principles are aspirational. So I take Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason to be not a metaphysical statement, but an aspiration to try to find theories which have ever better sufficient reason. By that, I mean if there ever is a point in your theory where you have to make a choice, where you could choose geometry A rather than geometry B, or choose point P rather than point Q to be the center of the universe, or a stationary point, you should have sufficient reason that is a rational basis for making that choice. And if you don't, then that choice is spurious, is illusionary, or you should seek to have dynamics make the choice for you. That gives rise to a number of secondary principles. The most influential and important is the identity of the indiscernible that says that if there are two events or objects or points, that have the same properties with respect to the relations with the rest of the system, they are to be identified. And that means something very strong for us. That means there are no symmetries. By a symmetry, I mean a transformation that takes the system, a state of the system, to another state of the system, which is different but indistinguishable. Symmetries are very important in the formulation of most of our laws of physics. In quantum mechanics, and Newtonian mechanics, we have symmetries. In quantum field theory, we have symmetries. And our view as relationalists is that every one of those symmetries is a sign that our theory is not fundamental, that you're describing a subsystem of the world with respect to a reference system and the symmetry is a translation of the reference system with respect to the subsystem or vice versa. It arises only because we have a partial theory that describes only a subsystem of the universe. Fundamental theories which obey the identity of the indiscernible have no symmetries. Because of Nether's theorem that means they have no conservation laws. Again, all of the theories we're familiar with, except general relativity, have conservation laws. Now, general relativity, with no atomic region, with closed boundary conditions, spatially closed boundary conditions, satisfies these conditions. By the way, no symmetries does not mean no gauge symmetries or no diffeomorphism symmetries. It means no global symmetries that take states to distinct states. If there are no symmetries, there are also no asymptotic regions. But general relativity with cosmological boundary conditions set up to be a system of a closed world has no symmetries and no conservation laws. And that's actually a theorem due to Carol Kukash in the 70s that translates to a statement about the lack of killing fields on the infinite dimensional phase space and configuration space of general relativity with those boundary conditions. Another way we often talk about the implications of relationalism is background and independence. And if you go back to the string wars when people were throwing names at each other, which thankfully we, we've grown up and matured past that point, we often were arguing about whether a theory should be background independent. 
What I mean when I say a theory should be background independent is there is no fixed background structure such as a geometry or an asymptotic region, which is not a solution to dynamical equations of motion, but simply a choice made, an arbitrary choice made in the construction of the theory. If the phase space or action or equations of motion of your degrees of freedom depend on a fixed, arbitrarily chosen background structure, we say that that is inconsistent with the principles of relationalism because you don't have sufficient reason for that choice. Alternatively, we advocate an approach, a strategy, to improving and making your fundamental theory more fundamental, which is identify such background structures and turn them to use, that is, replace them by dynamical degrees of freedom, which are solutions to equations of motion. And that's what happens with the global frames of reference in special relativity, which are background structures. I refer to the fixed background structure, the Minkowski geometry, in general relativity, when the geometry and the reference frames become dynamical and the solutions to dynamical law. Yet another way we talk about background independence is to go back to Leibniz's view that time reflects relations, and we usually think of those as causal relations amongst events, or that space reflects other kinds of relations amongst coexisting events. All these ideas are related to each other. So these are the principles of relationalism I will mostly refer to. There are a few others that follow. One of them is causal completeness. You never shall refer to a cause of in some chain of causes that takes you outside the dynamical system under study, which is assumed to be the universe as a whole. Um, that, by the way, uh, relationalism, in my view, implies that the complete theory we're looking for is a theory of the whole universe, that there is one universe and there's nothing outside of it. And People who talk about many universe theories and multiverses and so forth, in our view, are not thinking clearly enough about what we need to make a fundamental theory of nature. Okay, so that's where we start from. That's the principles of relationalism. Oh yes, and there's reciprocity, which is Einstein's principle that if an entity A exerts an influence or a force on an entity B, there is an, a, real, a backward influence or force from B to A. And that, that is stated in Einstein's 1916 general relativity paper. And it, it plays a role as well. Okay. Now, kinds of relationalism, because there are all kinds of approaches to fundamental physics, which are distinguished by various, the answers to various questions, and three of them will be important for what we're going to discuss today. First, I think if you're serious about trying to look for a frame of fundamental theory, you have to put your cards on the table. Are you a realist or are you an operationalist? I put my cards on the table, I'm a realist, which means I require for a fundamental complete theory a realist extension of quantum mechanics. I, I also claim that this is required for quantum cosmology because there are no observers out of the universe, no measuring incidents outside the universe. So a theory of the whole universe requires that the measurement problem be solved in some way that a realist, like a collapse theorist or a groy bohm pilot wave theorist would recognize. But there are people who choose to be operationalists, and in principle, I, I, they, they may be able to contribute something useful, but they should be clear, one should be clear about when one is being an operationalist and when one is being a realist. The second distinction is what you commit yourself to about the nature of time. 
many relationalists, for example, Julian Barber and Einstein at some times are timeless. They believe in the black universe. They believe that time is an illusion. It's real, but emergent. It's not part of the fundamental fabric of the world. It's not fundamental. And indeed, when you frame general relativity in a Hamiltonian framework and you attempt to quantize it, the time goes away. This is the famous problem of time. And this reflects the fact that the T in Schrodinger quantum mechanics, the T that we take the DDT with respect to, refers operationally to a clock outside the system being studied. And there is no clock outside the universe if you're studying the universe as a closed system. So there's a strong invitation to be a black universe person, a person who believes that time is not fundamental but emergent when one attacks the problem of quantum gravity. The alternative is to refuse that invitation and be a temporalist, to believe that, to go with Bergson rather than Einstein, to believe that the present moment and the passage of time are fundamental and that they eventually have to be worked into our fundamental physical theory. So that, that we would require a theory with an objective and basic distinction between the past, present, and future. And think of time as something active, as a process that creates continually the future events out of the present events. I'm sure we can come back to that. I'm, I, as I said, I've worked a lot on those questions the last five years, partly in collaboration with Roberta Mangibera Unger, and partly in collaboration with Marina Cortez and others. But I'm mostly not emphasizing that work in this talk, but I've got lots to say about that. Finally, there are pure relationalists and mixed or impure relationalists. A pure relationalist is somebody who takes Leibniz seriously that all properties of all objects and events in the universe are descriptions of relations with other objects or events. There are no intrinsic properties. An impure relationalist is somebody who admits that while the arguments for space and time to be treated relationally are convincing, there may be other properties of events or degrees of freedom which are intrinsic to those and are not aspects of relations. And we'll see that come in in distinguishing the different approaches to quantum gravity. Okay, any questions, comments at this point? Okay, I'll go on. Now, there are just three points of basic background that I think it's imp it'll be easier if I put them up front because they relate to all the approaches to quantum gravity. First, we often bemoan the fact that there are no experiments in the field of quantum gravity. And we let that buy us some freedom. For example, even some philosophers have indulged in criteria of non-empirical criteria of theory choice, accepting the propaganda that there are no experiments. But this is incorrect. There are experiments. There aren't many, but they have been carried out. They have had an influence. And there are other domains of phenomenology where there are possible experiments. So let me mention the knowledge that we do have access to. First of all, there's a class of phenomenology that come from what we call semi-classical approaches. These are approaches where we quantize matter and keep the space-time geometry classical. And there's a set of classic works done in the early to middle 1970s that established that there is a thermodynamics of space-time. When one combines general relativity and quantum theory, one finds thermodynamic phenomena. Horizons, whether cosmological horizons or black hole horizons, have entropy. 
equal to one fourth their area in Planck units. Accelerated observers in Minkowski space time see a horizon because of their acceleration. That is, there's a region of space time which signals from which is a horizon. And there is therefore an entropy and a temperature proportional to h bar times their acceleration over 2 pi times the speed of light, which is Unruh's relation. And finally, black holes have entropy that was discovered by Jacob Beckenstein, and they have temperature that was discovered by Steve Hawking. <laughs> and therefore evaporate at least if they're in a universe at zero temperature or lower temperature. These phenomena have not been so far observed, but they're in principle observable. For example, the effect of acceleration, the Anu effect has been, is possibly observable in certain high energy accelerators. Um, and most of us in quantum gravity take these as given and take it as the job of a quantum theory of gravity to explain and elucidate them, for example, to explain the entropy, not as a thermodynamic entropy, but as a statistical mechanic entropy having to do with loss of information about the quantum state. There are also corrections to this phenomenology which might be measurable, and might be observable. So that's one realm of phenomenology, and that certainly orients us, even if we haven't yet seen the talking radiation, say, from a black hole. There is a whole other class of phenomenology having to do with the expectation that there is a minimum length in quantum gravity, there is the Planck length, which is the, the square root of h bar g over the speed of light to the fifth power. This is a fundamental length. And we believe that geometry below this length scale is different, is discrete, or is somehow different than the smooth geometry that we see at the scales we have access to. But then you can raise an uncomfortable question. In whose reference frame is the geometry below the Planck length different or discrete? Because we know that lengths transform in special relativity. And this leads us to two options. Option one, Special relativity, Lorentz invariance, is broken in quantum gravity by the existence of a discrete quantum geometry which has a preferred reference frame. This is a remarkably common hypothesis in a number of different approaches to quantum gravity. And it turns out that it's testable. It's testable because it implies that the speed of light is energy dependent, and it turns out polarization dependent, at order of the energy over the Planck energy. And that is testable because we see photons coming from gamma ray bursts within a very narrow window of time, of the order of a second, having traveled for billions of years with a broad spread in energies of the order of tens of GeV. And if you plug those numbers in, you see that we ought to, if that effect is there, we ought to have observed it by now. Now, the history is that in the 90s, several of us realized that it would become observable with the precision of satellites being launched in the late in the 90s and early 2000s. And they developed a literature about the consequences of Lorentz symmetry breaking and ways to experimentally detect them. And these experiments have been done, the satellites were launched, and we can say to leading order there is no evidence for Lorentz symmetry breaking. So there is a real honest quantum gravity experiment testing a real honest quantum gravity phenomenology. Another alternative is that 
the transformation laws of special relativity modify themselves so that that fundamental length scale is invariant, so that all observers in all reference frames see the Planck length to be the same, in the same sense that, that all observers see the speed. That is, do the trick of special relativity twice, and this is what we used to call doubly special relativity. And it also leads to predictions for the experiments with gamma ray bursts. Although they're harder to see, so we can't say that they've been yet ruled out. But there are provocative observations involving correlations between high energy, very high energy neutrinos and photons from gamma ray bursts, which are on the edge of suggesting that those effects have been observed. And you can c come back and ask me, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested. So that is two alternative hypotheses about what what to think of the fundamental Planck length in terms of its transformation properties under special relativity. The development of those ideas leads to a whole interesting reason set of ideas called relative locality, and I invite. Laurent, Friedel, and I were two of the four people who developed that, and I invite you to ask Laurent about that. Laurent will certainly tell you whatever he talks about that he's really talking about relative locality, which is another way to think about the transformation properties of length and energy at the Planck scale. Now, there are still other phenomenological questions. There are approaches to quantum gravity that claim to determine some of the parameters of the standard model of particle physics and make some of the standard model predictable, some of those 30s odd parameters predictable. Then, and I'll mention those when I come to them, then there is a, a whole area of current interest having to do with putative quantum gravity effects at very large scales due to the presence of the cosmological constant. And there's a number of us, and I've played this game and I've given a number of talks and papers about this, in which we try to understand mind, the modification of Newtonian gravity in galaxies that there's some evidence for as a low energy, extremely low energy quantum gravity effect. And there's a general interest in what are called soft modes or extremely low energy quantum gravity effects. Okay, any questions, comments? I think that's all good background. So when we mention the different approaches to quantum gravity, there is a body of empirical work that one can ask if they address. Now, maybe everybody knows this. But when we want to understand quantum gravity, one way to think about it is that we're trying to understand a quantum field theory that has the property that is ordinary perturbation theory is not renormalizable, is not sensible. There is an approach to defining a quantum field theory due to Ken Wilson, which applies equally to such theories and ordinary perturbatively sensible theories, called the Wilsonian non-perturbative definition of a quantum field theory. And since that can apply to theories like quantum general relativity, which don't make sense in perturbation theory, we should reference this approach to quantum field theory when we're trying to construct a quantization of general relativity. So is this something you all know, or should I take five minutes and go over it? Take five minutes. Okay. So we approach defining a quantum field theory as follows. First, we truncate the theory drastically by making it a theory which has a finite number of degrees of freedom. Typically, we put it on a lattice. We, rather than having the infinite number of fields at every point in continuous space, we make a discrete lattice and consider fields defined either on the points of the lattice or on the links that connect the points. 
And this reduces our quantum field theory to an approximation which is an ordinary quantum mechanical system. Then, and that is defined by a length, the length between the lattice points, which we call the cutoff length. Now, we then ask, the theory has a number of coupling constants that determine the strengths of the interactions, as well as the masses of the particles and other phenomena. We ask if we change the cutoff scale, for example, we make it a half of what it is, so we admit more degrees of freedom. We have to then, that then affects the low energy physics, say scattering of two pions or something like that. We're interested in being able to change the cutoff scale without changing the low energy physics, many orders of magnitude below it. So it turns out we can adjust the coupling constants when we change the cutoff so that the low energy physics remains the same. And that requirement makes the low energy that makes the coupling constants functions of the cutoff scale. We get pat in the space of coupling constants. Imagine some Euclidean space whose coordinates are the values of the coupling constants. A theory is defined not by a point, but by a trajectory, which tells you how you change the coupling constants as you change the cutoff length to keep the physics that's predicted the same. Is that clear? Those are called renormalization group trajectories. We then want to define the theory by taking the limit in which the distance between the points on the lattice goes to zero or the cutoff length goes to zero. That causes us to investigate the asymptotic properties of these trajectories because the parameters will flow along the trajectories and to define the limit we got what happened. In particular, there are three options. One is the points just flow off to infinite coupling, and that doesn't get us a theory. The second choice is that we end up going around in cycles, and nobody's ever seen a theory where that happens, even though that's in principle possible. The third possibility is that there are fixed points where you change the cutoff scale and you don't have to change the parameters to keep the physics the same. And those are fixed points. And those define theories which are invariant under changes of scale, by definition, because we're changing the cutoff scale and the physics is not changing. Generically, Ken Wilson argues that for a theory to be defined, there must exist such fixed points, and we must choose the coupling constants on a trajectory that flows into one of these fixed points. That defines the quantum field theory, the fixed point and the flow into the fixed point. And that defines the quantum field theory equally for perturbative and non-perturbatively renormalizable theories. So this is what we mean by defining a quantum field theory outside of perturbation theory. And it's referred to as a Wilsonian definition of a quantum field theory. And we have been thinking about how that might apply to quantum general relativity or quantum gravity since the papers of Ken Wilson, Giorgio Parisi, and then Steve Weinberg in the late 1970s. Okay, any questions? Okay, one last bit of background. Gauge, we want to think about quantum gauge theories like quantum Yang-Mills theory or quantum electrodynamics. And they exist in different phases, just like gases, atoms can exist in liquid, solid, or gas phases. There are different phases of the gauge theories can exist in. And in some of the phases that gauge theories, that quantum gauge theories can exist in, the flux is quantized, either the magnetic flux or the electric flux, or both. If the one instance where the magnetic flux is quantized 
This magnetic flux of electromagnetism is quantized into discrete units of flux in the superconductor. And that's physics we understand very well. In the 1970s, a number of people realized that in yang mills theory, in a non-abelian yang mills theory, if the electric flux becomes quantized, so that the electric flux forms tubes with fixed units of flux, that this could describe the confinement of quarks, quarks being the elementary particles of the theory, with the quarks living at the ends of the line, quantized lines of flux. And the quantized lines of flux are characterized by a constant energy per unit length. So when we try to make, to separate the quarks by pulling them apart, we increase the energy linearly. And this is the phenomenon of quark confinement, which is understood to, to follow from quantized electric flux. Now, the great theoretical physicist, and the one, my generation has the generations of quantum field theory a bit older than us, we look up to like a Tuft and Polyakov, and in fact those are the, the most influential people of that generation. Polyakov made a conjecture, which is that in these phases where of a quantum gauge theory in which the electric and or the magnetic field flux is quantized, <laughs> The dynamics of the quantum gauge theory can be described in terms of an emergent set of degrees of freedom, which are the motion and the interactions of those flux lines, those quantized lines or tubes of quantized flux. And Polyakov imagined that you could describe quantum yang mills theory in an exact language and solve it, solve the quantum field theory exactly in terms of a dual set of variables, which were the quantized electric flux lines. And I call that Polyakov's dream or Polyakov's conjecture. And that's highly relevant for several approaches to quantum gravity. Any questions? Okay. So I told you we should worry about why are there different approaches to quantum gravity. I'm now going to describe five approaches, and I'm going to invite you to think about them not as theories, but as models which describe different regimes of possible phenomena where quantum gravity could be relevant. <coughs> the simplest one is called the causal set approach. In general relativity, given any two events, one can describe the causal relation between them. Uh, is, is event A in the causal future of event B? Is it in the causal past of event B? Or are they spatially separated so that there's no causal relation? And David Malamet proved a theorem a philosopher intervening in research in an important way, which said that if you know the causal relations between all events in the space-time manifold, you know the metric up to an overall conformal transformation. You know nine of the ten degrees of the freedom of the metric. If you know the causal relations plus volumes of regions, you know the whole metric. And this motivated several people, Principal Raphael Sorkin, Faye Dauker, and their collaborators, to posit that there was an atomic fundamental nature of quantum spacetime, which consists of a set of events and their causal relations. And full stop, that's the entire description of nature. So nature is nothing but events, and events are purely relationally described by the causal relations amongst them. So they are pure relationless and pure causal relationless. That's called the causal set approach to quantum gravity. It has strong points and weak points. The strong points are the conceptual simplicity, the radical nature of the hypothesis, the simple nature of the hypothesis. 
The weak points are the following. Given a classical space-time, one can sample a finite set of points in the classical space-time, and there is induced on that set of points a causal structure from the causal relations of the space-time. So one can go from a smooth space-time to a causal set. A causal set is just a set of points or events in the causal relations. Easily, you can easily approximate a space-time to some density of events by giving a sampling of events at that density in the causal relations. But there's an inverse problem. If I give you a set, just give you a set of events in the causal relations, you can prove that almost none of them come from sampling low-dimensional space-time manifolds. So almost all causal sets, sets of events and causal relations, approximate no or sample no space-time. So the question is, can we put our dynamics on a causal set that will make a low-dimensional space-time emerge? And no one knows the answer to that, so that's the leading question in the field, although the people dedicated to the field are certainly working on approaches to that. That's the major weak point. A strong point, by the way, I forgot to mention, is that Sorkin, from some reasoning about causal sets, in the 1980s, predicted the rough magnitude of the cosmological constant, which, which, it was, which was observed in 1997, 1998. And it's the only approach to quantum gravity to have predicted correctly the rough value of the cosmological constant. So it, is, it has a, a big win behind it. Now, a possible fix to the inverse problem is to become impure and let the events of the causal set have other attributes like energy and momentum that they transfer to each other. So the causal relations are not just pure causal relations, but they, they have some attributes which they pass around, like energy and momentum and perhaps various charges. And that turns out to go to admit models which, in which you can solve the inverse problem and see emerge a smooth space-time from a discrete causal set. Okay, that's my one slide description of causal sets. In all of these, but I, I want to emphasize, each of these deep approaches, each of these five approaches is the work of a few to many dedicated people. And hey, we've been hard here. This is hard stuff. And if my conclusion is that everyone has big, has important weaknesses, everyone also has important strengths that deserve the investigation that they were given. And I certainly think that's the case with causal sets. My set, yes? So, uh, going back to the uh you flip the slide back. The possible fixes that you mentioned. Yes. So, I mean, I guess I know a bit about some of this program. Who's, who's, which work are you referring to in the possible fix? Is that it's, more recent? It's, uh, it's my own work with Marina Cortez. Okay. Is that fairly recent, or is that just? Um, it's about the last six years. Okay. Thank you. We have a series of five papers together about what we call energetic causal sets. Thanks. Okay. The next approach is causal dynamical triangulations. And the basic idea here, and there are several different approaches to, to the general idea, is to follow Buckminster Fuller and take a curved surface and approximate it by a bunch of triangles tied together. Only if the surface is, if the space is three-dimensional, you approximate it by tetrahedrons. It's still called a triangulation. If it's four-dimensional, 
you you approximate it by dividing it up into four syntheses and so forth. But you make an approximation of a Riemannian or a pseudo-Riemannian geometry by a discrete structure called the triangulation. And in two dimensions, they really are triangles. And it's something that geometers know a lot about. And I don't think that Buckminster Fuller was the first to investigate it, although it was the first that I heard of it, was his geodesic dome. So think of a geodesic dome. Now, these are usually done to manifolds with Euclidean signature, but in the 90s, we're not alone, and Jan Omborg and a few collaborators applied this to Lorentzian manifolds, and they invented a theory called causal dynamical triangulations. The idea is to approximate a space-time by a discrete triangulation which has a fixed edge length so that all edges of these triangles that are space-like have a fixed edge length and all that are time-like have a fixed edge length. You then define, you then can write the Einstein equations and the action for the Einstein equations in terms of the edge lengths and the connectivity of the triangles or simplices. And it's well known how to do that. You then define the path integral quantum mechanics by defining the sum over all the geometries with fixed edge length, but all trying all manifolds that you can make with those fundamental units with those fixed edge lengths. And then you define, as in the Wilsonian approach, the continuum. You have some parameters, for example, the Newton's constant, the cosmological constant, and you make them functions of the edge length and try to see if you can follow Wilson's criteria and find a fixed point where the theory becomes scale invariant and define the theory in the limit where it could become scale invariant due to a fixed point. So that's the causal dynamical triangulation program. It's, con it's strong points. Conceptual simplicity, it is an honest quantization of general relativity using well-established methods. It's background independent. It's controllable. In the one plus one dimensional case, there are many analytic results. In the two plus one and three plus one dimensional case, there are many numerical results and they're well controlled. There's a big area, there's a lot of work that's been done over 20 years in many impressive computations. And there indeed seems to be a fixed point, a scale invariant behavior. The scale invariant regime is characterized by reduction in the apparent dimension of space-time from 3 plus 1 to 1 plus 1 so that things, degrees of freedom, propagate as if they're in a one-dimensional space at very short distances. And so there are many successes of this approach. And it's, it, it's exactly what you would mean from a Wilsonian point of view by a quantization of general relativity. There's really two weak points only. One of them is that the, when you d discretize and made the approximation in terms of triangles, you gave up some of the gauge symmetry, in particular diffeomorphism symmetry. And you get some of it back, but it appears you do not get the many finger time or space time diffeomorphism invariant gauge theory. And consequently, the low energy dynamics does not seem to be general relativity. It seems to be a different theory called Hajabalicious theory. And this unfortunate result, I, it's been developing over the last eight or ten years. It's, it's not completely certain, but there's a body of results that point to this. Of course, there may be ways to fix it, but this is the present status. And, of course, it has the, the regrettable feature that there are no testable predictions. But that's an, that's an important attempt at quantum gravity, very straightforwardly. 
and it fails on points of detail, but it's it's certainly a beautiful, in my opinion, it's a beautiful research program. Okay, any comments, questions? And, uh, so why do you take dimension reduction to be a strong point? Is it because you have general grounds to believe that some kind of dimension reduction could occur? Uh, could somebody say that louder? I heard oh, yeah, it's about symmetry reduction. Uh, why do you take dimension reduction to be a strong point? Because it gives you an explanation for why the theory might be sensible at short distances despite the large fluctuations of the space-time metric. It, it, it suggests that it gives you a narrative for why there is a scale invariant fixed point. Because the dynamics of general relativity are known to become scale invariant only in the case of a one plus one dimensional manifold. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I of course didn't say that. Okay. 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 So Let, yes. Um, so uh, recently, uh, Jill Hartong and Niels Overs have shown that at the field redefinition level, Ojava Lipschitz theory can be shown to be. Uh, you can build a theory from a bunch of fields on a generalized Newton Cartan background, um, and so I wanted. It, it's curious that starting with um, relativistic theory, and then doing this triangulation approach, you get back something that has essentially uh, a non-relativistic structure. Could, could you comment on that? Yes, the, the way they define their triangulations has a preferred simultaneity built into it. Oh, One might try to avoid that, but they were hoping that it goes, its influence goes away, and indeed it does seem to go away in one plus one dimensions. So they were hoping that they could get away with breaking the symmetry by having a preferred simultaneity, and that it would go away. Many features of the small scale dynamics in these kinds of things go away, because at scale invariant points, the large scale dynamics tends to become independent of what little mess you have made at the short distances. So it was reasonable to hope, but it doesn't seem to be turning out, at least so far. This, to me, this is certainly a live research program. And it's, it's, it's got very good people working on it, but very few, unfortunately. So it certainly could... I, Fotini, Marco Polo, and I showed that in one plus one dimensions, you really do get back the many finger time. But with the way that we did that didn't apply to higher dimension. Okay, here is a picture of a typical one plus one dimensional space time in, pulled from the numerical simulations in the causal dynamical triangulation approach. And you see you really have the triangles fitted together to make the space time. And that you really see a huge quantum fluctuations of space-time geometry, but when they average millions of such histories together, they get smooth, average, classical-like behavior. So the, there really is a lot of structure in that approach. Okay, asymptotic safety. Asymptotic safety basically takes the Wilsonian approach and invents a kind of perturbative, it's on the margins not perturbative, but essentially a perturbative approach to looking for these non-trivial fixed points and defining the quantization of general relativity by means of the Wilsonian program. It's growing, it's the one research program that over the last two or three years seems to be growing, growing quickly. There are a lot of results, a lot of young people going into it. Um, the first evidence for a non-trivial fixed point was a few papers in the 1980s. And then, for a reason I'll mention, people lost interest. But it's been reinvented and re-energized the last number of years. So there turns out to be lots of evidence for the hypothesis of a 
scale invariant behavior and a non-trivial fixed point from diverse truncation schemes, approximation schemes, calculational methods. There is also here evidence for dimensional reduction in short distances. And there's evidence that some of the parameters of the standard model, which are which have to be tied down to make an ultraviolet completeness. And for experts, these are Higgs couplings, which are not asymptotically free, become computable when you insist that that asymptotic safety is the way that quantum gravity coupled to the standard model would make sense. And there are, there are even uh, papers predicting the top quark mass by Astrid Icorn and collaborators and getting it right. There is only one weak point of this program, as far as I know. Well, one series, well, it's background dependent, one always says that. But that's really more the application than the principle. The one weak point is that there is an asymptotically safe theory of quantum, that extends quantum general relativity that is well understood. And that is the theory invented by Kelly Stella, which adds curvature square terms to the Lagrangian for general relativity. And that is known to have a ghost, an instability in the propagation in the graviton channel or spin two channel. What it means is that the theory is unstable, there's no energy bounding from below. You can't make the quantum theory unitary. And that is not so there is such a theory. The which doesn't mean that the theory that the workers in this program are working with is are constructing. They could be constructing a theory without the ghost, without the instability. But they have to demonstrate to us, since everybody uses various approximation methods, that they haven't rediscovered the sick theory with the ghost and the instability. And that was the reason why many of us gave this approach up in the mid 1980s, and it still, I think it's correct to say, haunts the theory. But of course, the people working on this are aware of this problem, and they have various proposed fixes, which are under development. Okay, so I think that one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize here is that I'm about to get to the more famous approaches. But in the background, when there's been a lot of noise about some other approaches, some people have been just following the rules of quantum field theory and applying them to quantum gravity and realizing near successes. And I think that's something that as philosophers, whatever question you bring to bear, you should be aware of and take into account. Me? Yeah. Could you just say a little bit more about the background dependence here? You mean because they're assuming a Minkowski background to do it? They, they, they basically, there are some words which, which are functional renormalization, but they basically do a perturbation theory calculation around a fixed background. So, but then you, you in your comments, you, you sort of seem to downplay that a little bit as, as something to do with application rather than fundamentally. I think it's a, it's a choice of technique that you can get a lot of results if you're willing to be background dependent. But you think this well, approach, in some sense, isn't background dependent? Or? The aspir it has aspirations not to be. I, I take this and the, and the causal and animal triangulation program to be the same idea, trying to apply the Wilsonian renormalization movement to find the theory in terms of a non-trivial fixed point. It's a, it's a different choice of methods. But the big problem, the big problem is the danger of the ghost. If they can slay the ghost, then I think that this would be the leading, the leading present candidate for quantum theory of gravity. Let me point out that the standard model of particle physics, in spite of all the successes, has a ghost as well. It's called the Landau ghost. And this doesn't prevent the standard model of particle physics from being highly useful, even though it does prevent us from thinking of it as a fundamental theory. 
So, but it is a flaw. That if that flaw could be resolved, again, let me just repeat. I think that anybody rating things objectively would say that this was a successful quantum theory of gravity. It even leads to real predictions for particle physics. Okay, now I'll come to the more famous approaches. So string theory, and I've been talking for an hour, and I have two, two more approaches to talk about. I think I'll be done in 20 minutes, but let's see. I have more to say about these approaches. String theory. Here's my here's a basic introduction to the idea of string theory. Pick a background space time with a fixed metric. And imagine a two-dimensional surface moving in that space-time. Put on the dynamics that the surfaces be extremal and study the quantum dynamics of those surfaces moving quantum mechanically in the fixed classical space-time. Impose that that quantum dynamics be conformally invariant, which is a very powerful condition in two dimensions. That implies the Einstein equations are satisfied by the space-time background that the, that the surface is moving in. That's a result of Dan free Dan. If you further impose that the dynamics be fully consistent, you, you realize that the surface, the space-time must have 26 dimensions or 25 plus 1 dimensions, but satisfies the Einstein equations. If you impose supersymmetry, you kill a tachyon, you get down to 9 plus 1 dimensions. The beautiful thing about this is that it's a real unification. It includes massless spin 1 particles and therefore incorporates gauge fields and gauge interactions. It incorporates gravitational interactions. All the different interactions in the standard model plus general relativity are coded into the breaking and joining of these surfaces. So it's a beautiful, beautiful idea, and it's deserved a lot of attention. But notice it's a completely different kind of idea than the previous ones I discussed. This is a, a hypothesis about what the world might be. It's not an attempt to just take general relativity and quantum mechanics and combine them. So it's an altogether different kind of idea and kind of research program. In a certain sense, much less well motivated. The others are just motivated by taking general relativity and quantizing it, and clearly much more ambitious at the same time. There are strong points and weak points. Here's my take on it, and I have to preface this by saying I mean, I'm not usually associated with string theory, but I've spent many years of my life believing in the string theory research program and working on it. I have about 20 papers in the string theory program. So this is a program that I've certainly cared about, even if I was never working in its mainstream. So the strong points are that the theory is ultraviolet finite, that means finite at high energies or short distances, to a certain approximation called the two-loop or genus two approximation. There's a genuine unification of gravity with the gauge fields and the fermions. It realizes Polyakov's conjecture, that's why I introduced Polyakov's conjecture, in a background-dependent context, i.e., the surface, the two-dimensional surface describes loops moving on a background space-time, and, and what emerges out of that is gauge fields as well as gravity. So it realizes Polyakov's conjecture. I suggested a very important discovery in mathematical physics called the ADS-CFT correspondence, which, which I regard as being, as a, there are different versions of it, but at least some versions have a lot of evidence for them that goes way beyond the string theory context. So by now, it's really a separate idea and a separate research program, but it's, it's suggested it. It rise to it. It gets the study of some black holes right. Get, there's a class of black holes which are called extremo, which have the maximal charge and the maximal spin possible. And their entropies are computed exactly correctly. 
in string theory. And the ones that are nearly extreme will have temperatures which are also computed exactly. And these, these can be reproduced in quite beautiful, complicated formulas. One reason the theory can lead to many results is that there is a, a small parameter, a small dimensionless parameter, the string coupling constant, which measures the strengths of the couplings of the services which also is a ratio of scales of the gravitational quantum length, the Planck length, to this, what's called the string length, the scale of the strings themselves. And at alpha string equals zero, you have general relativity plus quantum field theory. So there's a controllable expansion in a small parameter that lets you get many results by relating them to results that already exist. And for me, the most important strong point is it solves the problem that I mentioned at the beginning of, of having the Planck scale discreteness coexist with Lorentz invariance and Planck ray invariance. It solves that in a beautiful way. And when I understood that, that came from work of Leonard Susskind and others. That was when I switched to string theory, to working on string theory. So that's quite a strong body of results which have, to me, justify a lot of work that's been done. But there are also persistent weak points, and these weak points have been on the table since about 20 years, and there's been very little motion in, in resolving them. The proof of ultraviolet fineness is incomplete. Despite many claims in the literature, the paper that's usually quoted is giving the proof of ultraviolet fineness is incorrect and has been acknowledged to be incorrect. So we don't have a proof of ultraviolet finding this past two loops. There is no background independent formulation in spite of a number of people looking very hard for one. It requires ad hoc addition of the extra dimensions, the, extra, the addition of maximal supersymmetry, extra degrees of freedom, the brains, d-brains, which seem to be irrelevant for physics. Because of the extra dimensions, it requires compactification. That is when you shrink six of the dimensions down. Those are generically unstable, as Einstein realized already by 1919. That's why Einstein rejected the Kavuza Klein theory originally, although he originally encouraged them. It's unstable generically. To stabilize it, you have to introduce many additional fields and parameters. This is the so-called moduli problem, and it's a generic problem. One outstanding question is, are there any stable vacua with positive cosmological constant corresponding to what's seen in nature? There are various claims. This has recently become an area of contention. There were claims in about 2002, 2003, under the name of KKLT, that there were stable vacua, but those are, those are considered controversial, and there's a big fight or argument going on about it among experts. So I won't weigh in, except that the 2003 results, that if there are any stable vacua with positive cosmological constants, there are an infinite number of them. And so we have what's called the landscape problem. The theory makes no predictions predicts an infinite number of universes with different dimensions, different spectra of forces, of different kinds of fermions, and so forth. And the theory seems to have no predictive power. By the way, that this would be the result of understanding string theory was realized already. It became popular and was discussed in 2003 by the Stanford group. But um, Andy Strominger was telling anybody who would listen in 1987, 1988, that this would be the fate of the theory, and that there would be no phenomenology possible. So that's the, I think I've been fair. I certainly understand why anybody gets enthusiastic about this theory. I understand why anybody seeing the lack of motion to resolve these fundamental difficulties over 20 years to be frustrated with it. And we dearly need help from philosophers 
let me go on to loop quantum gravity and show you some slides on that. That, again, has impressive strong points and impressive weak points. And in light string theory has a relatively large community of people who worked on it for many years with the strong points and the weak points not changing much over many years. Now, given that I've got uh, the time, I can go right to the strong points and weak points, or I can give a little bit of an introduction. Do you guide me? Yeah, that's true. Why don't you give the introduction? I mean, we can, because if we started half an hour earlier than we had scheduled, we can go a little over if people have a lot of questions after you're done. So, okay. So this is a non-technical sketch of the picture of physics that blue quantum gravity comes from. Blue quantum gravity comes from a quantization of what's called the Ashtakar formulation of general relativity, which is a formulation, usually we think of the metric as the fundamental degree of freedom of general relativity, and the space-time connection as derivative from that, literally constructed by derivatives of the metric. Ashtakar is one of a number of configurations which, of, of approaches which take the configuration space to be the space-time connection. And it's a particular, we take uh, the chiral half, that is, we divide the Lorentz group into a left-handed part and a right-handed part. And we take the connection for only one of those halves to be the configuration variable. The momentum variable then turns out to give you information back about the metric. Electric flux is area. So if you compute the electric flux of that connection, treating it as if it were a Yang-Mills field, the electric flux is the, through a surface is the area of that surface. Intersections of flux lines give the volumes of regions. And most importantly, the Einstein equations take their simplest <laughs> possible form there are simple quadratic equations in the E and B fields. You should think about this like a, like a gauge theory, like a, a weird version of electromagnetism. Defined on space-time, it has no space-time metric, because the metric is going to be constructed from the electric field. And that's astounding. When you usually write the Einstein equations, you have the determinant of the metric, one over the determinant of the metric, the metric, the inverse of the metric. And the whole thing is non-polynomial. In these variables that Ashtakar discovered, the Einstein equations are literally quadratic equations. So, so it's easy to quantize. And you can use the methods of Yang-Mills theory, especially the methods developed by Polykov and Wilson and other people who were inspired by Polykov's dream, by Polykov's conjecture. Because when you quantize this theory, you discover that you're in a phase where the electric field flux is quantized. And, but since the electric field flux is area, that means the area comes in a discrete spectrum. There are lines of quantized electric flux, and they carry quantum area. Any surface that appears has an associated quantum area. And similarly, there are quantum volumes. The quantum states of the theory are solved for and there are graphs of quantized electric flux that <laughs> intersecting in nodes that carry energy and volume, and these are called spin networks. The Einstein equations, those quadratic equations in the E and B fields, are represented by local changes at the intersection of the graphs. These cha local changes, so for example, a node might go to a triangle. Changes in the intersection of the graphs are derived from the quantization of the classical theory. So there's a simple visual and operational implementation of the quantum Einstein equation acting on these graphs, just realizing exactly Polykov's conjecture of Polykov's dream. The, those local changes you can think of as events, and they have causal relations. So there's a causal set embedded in every quantum space-time constructed using these equations. Did I hear a question? I don't think so, no. 
Okay. Uh, if you're starting with a state described by such a network, you make a sequence of local changes dictated by the quantum Einstein equations. You get a history, which you can treat by a path integral quantization. That's called a spin foam. Or you can stay at the Hamiltonian level, and you can solve exactly the quantum equations that describe the Hamiltonian theory, i.e. the equations of Wheeler and DeWitt, the DeWitt, the Wheeler DeWitt equations, which are the famous equations that describe quantum gravity, uh, can be exactly solved. And we can develop a phenomenology of, in fact, an infinite number of solutions to those equations. So real using Polycarp's dream kind of physics, which was invented to understand quark confinement, we have solved quantum general relativity and discovered a rich phenomenology of quantum geometry and quantum space times. Just some pictures. That's a spin network. The labels count the, the quantum electric flux on them. This same structure was invented by Roger Penrose, who named them spin networks. But they come from diagonalizing the operators which represent the energy. The quantized electric flux are equivalent of the energy and the volume of regions. That's how, let me just go quickly through this. That was how a surface, if you look in the upper left hand side, you see a surface pierced by a line of quantum electric flux, and then that surface gets a quanta area proportional to h bar g. Time and in the spectra, let me emphasize, have been computed. So the theory tells you what the spectra are, the precise spectra are for area and volume of regions of quantum geometry. A very large spin network can represent a quantum geometry that can be coarse grained and look smooth and continuous. So that's so we have the expectation that applying statistical mechanical kind of ideas and methods to these structures should give back a continuum of space time satisfying Einstein's equations. That's the big dream here. These are what some of the elementary transitions of the graphs look like. And so there's a one imagine doing these kind of transitions over and over again. And you generate a structure which is a history of a quantum state, of a quantum state of geometry. That's called a spin foam. Okay, uh, let me just talk about the strong points and the weak points. And I got carried away here with the strong points, but I, <laughs> <laughs> there's some serious weak points too. So the strong points. This is just general relativity plus quantum mechanics. Well, we've just written general relativity in a wiser form than Einstein did, so which greatly simplifies the field equations from the infinite non-polynomial field equations to quadratic equations. And hence we can solve them, we can quantize them and solve them as operator equations. We realize Pauli calls Green, his conjecture, at a background independent level, these are networks at electric flux, with the fundamental laws being describing how the networks at electric flux evolve in time. Because we have diffeomorphism invariance, this picture is purely relational. I, it doesn't matter where two graphs are embedded only up to their internal connections and the topology. There's no, if you move the graph around, you slide around, it does still corresponds to the same state. So it gives you a purely relational picture of quantum geometry and space-time quantum geometry. It predicts precise discrete structures for this quantum geometry. It predicts the spectra precisely. There's strong evidence, not nothing that I would say is a proof, but strong evidence for ultraviolet finiteness in the sums over histories of the kind I described. It uses a lot of known methods from gauge theories and what are called topological field theory. So the methods that we do these computations with are well tested from, from quantum gauge theories. It's background independent. You can extend it to admit ordinary gauge fields, fermion scalar, supersymmetry, whatever you like. It gets, you have a black hole without, with not near the extreme values of spin and charge. 
It gets their entropy right and their temperature right. It gets the energy, the entropy and temperature of the series space-time right. When you apply it to cosmological models, it eliminates the cosmological singularities and cleanly post it that before this the Big Bang there was another universe which then collapsed, bounced, and generated the Big Bang. There is some evidence for the emergence of general relativity from spin phones in a certain class of limit having to do with taking those areas large. And there's some evidence for the emergence of graviton states. Those are the strong points, and they've been the strong points for at least 15 years. The weak points have been also for a long time the weak points. Can I just so it limit, yes? When you say that it admits um, gauge fields and matter fields, you mean they can, they, they don't have, they, it doesn't, there's not a unification with those fields, right? You mean those fields can live on the spin network in something analogous? Like if that. you start if you start with Einstein general relativity coupled to the standard model, and you take this, you extend the same method of quantization, you get a description of quantum gravity interacting with fermions, gauge field, and scalar particles. But there's nothing that dictates. So you can have anything you like. If you like supersymmetry, you can have supersymmetry. If you like. SU5, you can have SU5. There's nothing that prevents you from describing the standard, the, the fields of the standard model, but there are two caveats. One is it doesn't ask for it, it doesn't tell you anything new about unification. And the second caveat is that I'm coming to. Okay, so the first weak point is that the continuum limit is not nearly well enough understood. The emergence of a classical space time is plausible but far from proven. And a lot of, a number of very smart people are working very hard on that problem. But it is a very hard problem. There's a, there's a property of quantum space time that must be provable, which is that the energy of an isolated system is positive. There's a positive energy theorem for classical general relativity, famously proved by Whitman, Schoen, and Yao. And we have been unable to extend that theorem to the quantum theory. And that's a very serious problem because it's not that energy isn't bounded from below and the theory can't apply to nature. There's something called the fermion Dublin problem. And that's a technical problem with the representation of fermions. But if you've heard of chiral fermions and you know that the standard model has chiral fermions means there's a niche mass between left and right hand in states of fermions, like neutrinos. And that's the necessary feature of the standard model. And there are doubts that this theory can incorporate that. But that's under discussion. I, um, with Jacob Barnett, we published a paper pointing out that the fermion doubling problem could be, there could be such a problem, could be severe. There's what I, and that, that's the other big issue about matter. It's a technical issue, maybe it's solvable, but it has to be solved. As I said, it incorporates matter fields, but doesn't speak to unification. And very importantly, we can understand this as the expansion, as a continuation of some small parameter around what we know. The great advantage of string theory is that there's this dimensionless parameter, such that it's zero, you're back to what you know, and you turn on this parameter a little bit, and you're in the string world. There's no controllable parameter that takes you from classical general relativity to the root quantum gravity world. So there's no way to do to, to do many calculations you'd like to do. And again, there are no testable predictions. Okay, questions? Quick question. Yeah. Why did the supersymmetry help with your second bullet point? You would think that it would, because in fact the history of Wins proof of positive energy involves supersymmetry. Uh, you probably are referring to that. The su a theory with supersymmetry has energy. Uh, with supersymmetry and whose inner product is appropriately defined has positive energy because the energy is the square of a supersymmetry charge. 
And the problem is, we've thought about that, we've, we've played with it. I, there are papers in the literature which try in a formal sense to extend Witten's proof of positive energy or the proof of positive energy and supergravity to loop quantum gravity. And there are some of the formal steps that so far we don't know how to fill in in a convincing way. So you're right on, maybe that will do so. And maybe it will turn out that only the supersymmetric version of loop quantum gravity makes sense. And I, would, I, I wouldn't be unhappy with that. I should say that my research program for years, I can't say it is any longer, but for many years, starting in the mid-90s, it was to unify string theory and loop quantum gravity. Because they're both based on realizing particles vision. They both are based on the duality of dynamic, giving dynamics to loops of electric flux. There are many points of contact and many. And there are a number of younger researchers who are working with supersymmetric on gravity now, with that same aim. So another question about the, we had a, I told you we had a talk about supersymmetry and superspace this morning. But in this, when you incorporate supersymmetry into, into loop quantum gravity, I take it you don't have spin networks for superspace or anything like that. So it's on a totally different footing from ordinary space. Yeah, can you just excuse me for a second? Just repeat the question while I do something I forgot to do. Okay. Just repeat the question. I didn't hear. We sort of had that. a discussion of whether, to what extent, superspace could be thought of as being on a similar footing, you know, sort of philosophically, conceptually, to ordinary space. But I oh, take it what you're talking about with supersymmetry and loop quantum gravity, superspace is completely separate from. Um, the ordinary space, so there's no spin networks for superspace or anything like that. Is that oh, right? good. No, there. Uh, the way you do it is the spin network is essentially a quantization of a Yang Mills group which has a local symmetry, say SU2 or the Lorentz group. <laughs> and in, in, in supergravity, there is also an extension of the Lorentz group to a supersymmetric extension called OSP1 or OSP2, depending on this n supersymmetry, whether n is 1, 2, up to 8. And you have OSP2, 1, up to OSP2, 8. And you can make a spin network to, rep to live in this space. Oh, okay. And from then on, the results get technical, but I can give you some some references for that. Um, Ted Jacobson just developed the original extension to supergravity, and a lot of work was done in the early 90s by Yi Ling and myself and some others. Okay. Ori Poo and... Okay. So what I said uh, was wrong. Um, we don't we don't do it by by finding a supersymmetric geometry the way that some approaches to supergravity are based on no but it's equivalent you can you can see and in fact if you go back to the roots of the Ashtakar approach Ashtakar's variables were originally hinted at in some papers by Amitabha Sen who was studying supergravity. And the idea that you can take the, the structure of general relativity and split it into chiral halves, so even though general relativity is parity invariant, it's sufficient to express dynamics for a chiral half, as for half that transforms under left-handed Lorentz transformations and doesn't transform under right-handed transformations, like neutrinos. So basically, this is the space-time connection that a neutrino would see. And that that's sufficient for the expressing the dynamics of general relativity is a beautiful fact. And it was discovered by Amitabha Sen in the context of supergravity. And so there's an intimate connection historically between the Ashtakar formulation and all the structure that followed and supergravity. Okay, so that's 
Now I would just like to draw some conclusions. <laughs> but I can also stop, given that I've been going for an hour and a half, and we can have discussion. I can hear your conclusions. Does anybody have things they want to add at this point? Um, so, in I think slide two, you mentioned that the relation is you did not admit uh, space time with an asymptotic boundary, and I just wondered if you would comment on how that sits with, for instance, ADS CFT correspondence, which I think you mentioned as a promising result at least coming out of string theory. I think the ADSC, uh, so first of all, maybe it's worthwhile saying what the ADSCFT correspondence is. I'll say, it in the, I'll, I'll say it in two versions, the version which is best supported and the more ambitious version which is, is some but less evidence for it. Consider a conformal field theory in D dimensions. This is a quantum field theory which is uh, a certain kind of scale invariance called conformal transformation, invariance under conformal transformations. Scale, scale similarity. No, but anyway, there's a group which includes scale, the Lorentz group, the Poincaré group, scale transformations and some more transformations called the conformal group and you can try to construct quantum field theory invariant under that conformal group in flat d-dimensional, d plus one dimensional space time. Now the hypothesis, and this was originally made by Polycar in the context of looking for a home for his dream to live in, but then was made in a more serious and lasting way by Maldusena, is that if you can, you can consider that d plus one dimensional Minkowski space as the bound of a anti time with one more dimension. And you can relate quantum field theory results or quantum field theory observables in the d plus one dimensional flat space time to the computation of gravitational quantities, quantities in classical general relativity in this space-time with one more dimension. And that, there's of course a specific way to say that, but that there's a lot of evidence for, I think. So the idea that a conformal field theory on a flat Minkowski space can have many of its quantities computed by a corresponding expression in the gravitational theory in anti de Sitter space time, one dimension up, there's a lot of evidence for. Now, the more ambitious hypothesis or conjecture, which I think is limited to some but limited evidence for, is that the quantum theory of gravity with the, in a higher dimension, with certain boundary conditions on, is completely equivalent as a quantum mechanical system that the Hilbert spaces are identical and there's a map between the operator algebras to the quantum field theory on the boundary space time. And that, uh, we certainly can't rule it out, but um, that, that was the original idea of Juan Maldesena, was to define the quantum theory of gravity, particularly maybe some extension of string theory, in the higher dimensional theory by its correspondence to the quantities in the quantum field theory and the lower dimensional theory. So that's, the, at least the first version has been an extremely fruitful idea in mathematical physics. There are many contexts and many results to support it. Um, but it doesn't have directly necessarily anything to do with quantum gravity unless you see that you, you consider the second conjecture, which is much stronger, is true. So that's, I think, a fair rendering of the situation. It's certainly, the, in the first limited version, it's one of the most beautiful results ever to come out of mathematical physics. And 
certainly there's a lot of beautiful, important structure there. But it's not but it's not necessarily related to the quantum theory of gravity. On the other hand, it was inspired by a hypothesis that it took called the holographic hypothesis. The holographic hypothesis is well let me just sketch what I would say next. Let me go on, is that we should be trying to construct quantum gravity not by models and hypotheses of the kind that I've been describing, these different approaches, but by controlling, going back and trying to invent first principles. And I would argue for at least four first principles, one of which would be a version of the holographic hypothesis. So it's certainly closely related. To the way that it took positive the holographic hypothesis in 1993 wasn't very close to the ADS-CFT correspondence, which was proposed five years later, it's four years later. It was really an idea about quantum foundations and a, hidden variable, a certain kind of hidden variable theory. But it inspired first Lenny Susskind and then Mal DeSena to conjecture applications to string theory. So, well, maybe do you want to go on with the conclusions for like another five or ten minutes, something like that? Okay, I think that's, I'm about good for that anyway. So first, and I want to emphasize, these are my personal conclusions. I'm, I'm not, I won't be surprised if people disagree or argue with them. So first, I think there's a plausible picture which has emerged from the successes of the different approaches. And that is that there is something like an atomic or a discrete quantum space-time. There is a, some discrete quantum notion of geometry, which replaces a Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian geometry. Loop quantum gravity gives a complete description of one version of that, but its general features are that there would be discrete events, there would be causal relations between events, and also that properties like energy, momentum, geometry, quantum geometry, and there would be simple laws that construct these discrete quantum space-times. So that's plausible but by no means proven. It's a lot of different approaches agree that, that underlying, in other words, just like in the end of the 19th century, both things hypothesized that under the smoothness of matter, liquid, solids, gases, there was an atomic structure. We, we are in the presence of a hypothesis that there is an atomic structure to space and to space-time. And that maybe the causal set description gives us a first sketch of what that might look like, and a spin foam, spin network gives another more filled just look like. So that's plausible and um, suggests some strategies. I think it's plausible, I haven't talked about it, but some ver the, the holographic idea that there's a fundamental relationship between the area of a surface and its capacity as a channel for information <laughs> is true. And you don't need asymptotic boundaries to say that. I think it's plausible that classical space-time is emerging from this microstructure, and there is a schema for that to prove that emergence, which is a, something I call Jacobson emergence. Ted Jacobson basically, in a very important paper in 1995, wrote down conditions that such an atomic theory of space-time or space-time would have to satisfy, so that the Einstein equations emerge as the thermodynamic equations of state of that microscopic system. So the relationship between classical space-time treated by general relativity and this fundamental quantum space-time would be thermodynamic. It would be just like the thermodynamic relations between the, the atoms and matter that people studied early in the 20th century. So this is a plausible picture to me and to many of us. And it kind of answers when you, why why be background independent? Be background independent 
because then your job is to specify what the theory is about. What are the ingredients of the theory? There are not things that live on classical space-time. Then your instruction is, the classical space-time has to emerge. What's the schema? What's the strategy for getting classical space-time to emerge? Well, it's just like the late 19th, early 20th centuries through thermodynamics. So, string theory, it's, is it the Jacobson emergence that string theory doesn't have? I mean, there's no way to see the um, Friedan results as a kind of thermodynamic <laughs> Not so far, but there is a very beautiful area that's opened up in the last three or four years, which is really populated by people from several of the different fields and quantum information theory, in which they've been discovering instances of this emergence as part of the ads cft correspondence. That is, the emergence of the extra dimension is understood as due to the thermodynamics of space-time. Originally, presented in the boundary theory. This is a very important development, set of developments, and Ted Jacobson's work is at the center of it, indeed Ted is at the center of it. So one of the things is, I mean, I live at Perimeter with a very good string theory group, and, and one of the things which is, I think it's a, a, an important positive thing to say about the string theory community is that recognizing the, the contradiction that my description, and I think that most of them would say that my description is fair, there are huge pluses and huge problems. Very few people in the string theory community now do the theory of strings in anything like what the theory of strings would have been recognized to be, say, in 1990. Um, They've branched out into areas which are inspired by the successes of string theory. And one of them is the ADS-CFT phenomenology independent of string theory. And that's proved to be a very useful context for studying Jacobson emergence. And there are a number of very beautiful results. We had a whole summer school um, two years ago about this called It from Cubit. Rob Myers, who's on our faculty, is somebody very involved in this. It from Bit, of course, is the famous statement of John Wheeler that everything builds up from information. And there's a kind of quantum information um, propaganda that now tells us that it is from Qubit. And I, that's another place that you guys, you philosophers, are needed to make us honest and give, <laughs> give a good review. Because there is something very powerful being hypothesized there. And to my mind, it's very confusing. The reason why it's confusing is people don't get straight what's realism and what's operationalism. And that's a general issue with quantum information approaches, is that there are a number of results that seem strong enough that they ought to be expressible in a realist language that are trapped in an operational language. That's, an, that's a whole other subject of discussion. Okay. So, so I'm directing, certainly this is an area which has a lot of current interest and there's a lot of hope and I added and I would say in my, I have different hats, there's my trying to go deep and think about time hat, there's, but I also still occasionally put on my loop quantum gravity hat and think of what loop quantum gravity can contribute. And there's also a literature within loop quantum gravity about the Jacobson emergence and holography and information and so forth. So it's something that we can all agree is interesting. Um, this was to be a more technical introduction to changes and emergence, but maybe I'll skip that given the time. Yeah. Back to it. This seems like a pretty good space to finish, or is there something else you wanted to... No, actually, why don't we end there? That's great. I might just see if there's any last couple of questions people have, if that's okay. I'm happy, keep them. <laughs> uh, what is the question? Sure, okay. <laughs> would you mind telling, would you mind telling, telling us a bit more about Jacobs in the emergence, please? Uh, what? I'm sorry, just would to you, say it again. Would you mind continuing um, talking about Jacobs in emergence for a bit? Okay, well then I, this is the most technical 
slide. So let me just go through this slide. If you, you can shut me up, throw things at me, I'm, I'm not sensitive. So assume an, an atomic discrete quantum space-time T consisting of events and their causal relations but other, plus other intrinsic properties. Okay, so that's our framework, we assume that. And I, had, I need that among the other quantities of these causal relations are that energy and momentum are transmitted having to do with matter. So there is matter already at this level. And it has properties of energy and momentum and maybe other charges. And we also can talk about quantum area. Now given that structure, I can talk about what's called a causal diamond. Given an event E in a causal structure, you can talk about the causal future of E. It's all the events to the causal future of it. Given an event F, you can talk about all the events in its causal path. You can, you can take E and F and talk about the intersection of all the events to the future of E and to the past of F. And that is something, and you can visualize that easily. In a discrete quantum space time, that's a finite set. And it's called a causal diamond. And they're the subject of a lot of investigation. They're beautiful things to think about. I have a boundary, and the boundary has three parts. If there were classical general relativity, it would be the light cone coming from the past of F, the light cone coming from the future of E, and where they intersect on the two sphere, which we call the waste, the intersection of the past light cone of the future event and the future light cone of the past event. Okay, so everybody got that in their head, the causal diamond? Associate to every causal diamond a Hilbert space. And associate to every causal diamond an area which is computed from the information, from the data, and it's the area of that, that sphere that where the two light cones intersect. Well, the first postulate is that the area of, of the causal diamond which is the one invariant way you can specify an area from that causal information, is related to the dimension of the Hilbert space that is associated with the causal diamond. In the way that Beckett seen would insist on, that a fourth of, fourth of the area in Planck units is allowed to the dimension of the Hilbert space. So that's assumption two. Assumption three, assume a thermal state. Assume that the, the quantum state very such causal diamond is actually a maximally entangled state, which at this level of detail I say is a thermal state. Um, I would have to, there's a lot more to say about that thermal state than I would have to really get out my technicalities and start throwing around some formula. But there is a well-defined special state we mean when we say a maximally entangled state. Now assume that classical space-time is emergent from this microstructure. I assume there's a coarse grain of the microstructure which gives rise to a classical space-time such that the causal diamonds of the microstructure and that is causal diamonds in the classical space-time. That's an assumption. I'm not proving that. But I'm assuming that the kinematics of general relativity emerges. Why do I assume that? Because I don't know how to prove that. Okay. Then, from those four assumptions, I can prove the Einstein equations. So that's the structure of the relation. And there are ADS-C of T versions of that logic, which, are, which have been studied by ADS-C of T quantum information people. But the, more or less the way I stated it is a schema for a number of different contexts in which we prove Jacobson emergence. Okay, is that, is that sufficient to whet your appetite? No, thank you. Okay. I think we've really, you've given us an awful lot of time here now, so I, I think we should probably finish it up, unless you had any final words. Uh, <laughs> final words. Um, we don't get to say final words, you know. Um, the, the quantum theory of gravity, let me, let me just say something personal and challenging. 
I decided to go into and try to work on quantum gravity and be a physicist when I was 17. Uh, I think I, I, I've made an honest attempt to contribute something to it and contributed a little bit, and I think I have. I'm trying to honestly characterize what has been achieved, of course, mostly by other people. It's it's a community of people. It's, the quantum gravity work is actually millions of people who are very dedicated. We're we're all trying to make a revolution here in science. We're all giving all we got for many years and many decades. And this is a fair summary, I think, of where we are, what we've learned. And my lesson, which you didn't, which I didn't get to, but my real lesson is this is all great. This gives us a lot to think about, but now we have to go deeper. That is, we can't avoid the stage of theory construction, which we've all been kind of avoiding one way or the other, in which we guess principles and develop reasoning and methods that reason directly from principles. So what I'm trying to do and what I would suggest, I think we've learned about different models, different possible quantum gravitational phenomena, but everyone, when I, these are well-motivated approaches, they might have gone all the way and so far none of them do. And rather than continuing to be any one of them, I think we take them as lessons learned, and now we really have to go deeper and face three things. One of them is I think we can't avoid the measurement problem. Because the quantum theory of gravity has to be quantum, quantum theory of cosmology, and that's a closed system. And I think Everett isn't good enough, although it took work by good philosophers to really nail down whatever it means. I think in the end, the conclusion is it's not good enough. So I think we really have to solve the measurement problem. And two, we really have to address the very difficult issues about the nature of time. And so we have to go deep, we have to keep going. And I hope that um, within you know, three, four, five or ten years. The one thing that is certainly we're prepared, if the right idea comes along, we'll recognize it, I think. So we're, we're, all, we're all hoping and waiting for something to come which will address all these technical and conceptual and philosophical questions with exactly the right set of principles or hypotheses that will capture how nature unifies the world. Okay, then.